All right, take your Bibles, turn or tap or click or whatever you need to do with your version of the Scriptures there. Go over to John 3. We are well underway with our new series. If we're well underway, it's probably not considered a new series anymore. I think this is the fifth message or so that we've had now um, in living the good life as we're embracing Jesus and the life He offers. We have looked at each time at the beginning that theme verse or verses from John chapter 20 where John basically says, these things have I recorded or have been recorded for us. There are lots of miracles and signs uh, that are not recorded, but these are recorded so that you might believe and that believing you might have eternal life. And so we have gone over uh, each time, just by way of uh, review, I'll say this again, eternal life is conditional. It's conditional upon our doing what? Believing. Not our being religious, not our uh, crossing this T and dotting that I, but it's, it's conditional upon believing that Jesus is the chosen one of God to be that giver of eternal life. And not only is it conditional, but it is something that happens continuously. It says that, and in, in that believing, um, you might have this life, this, this eternal life. That This eternal life starts at the moment of salvation. So in this series, we are basically trying to see the importance of embracing Jesus, first of all, as the giver of eternal life and receive that eternal life but also along the way to see elements of that eternal life that happens now that we don't have to wait until we go to heaven to experience. And so following Jesus right now is a part of eternal life. We can have eternal life and do have eternal life if we're in Christ even right now. Last time, we looked at some initial proofs that Jesus himself gave as the giver of this eternal life as he began his adult ministry. Today, Jesus has some interaction with a religious leader and points out in this interaction the superiority of his gospel message over the rules and traditions of a religious system. Religion, it's a funny word. It is a word we often use, especially within Christianity. Um, the Oxford Dictionary gives a definition for religion that reads as a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. I'm going to hone that definition in a little bit further and say this, that religion is often placing a high value on what we do for God. Religion is often us placing a high value on what we do for God. And so for our purposes today, when I refer to religion, I'm talking about the following of a set of rules, practices, and habits in order to get what we desire from God. Now, Let me just say off the bat, in case you're wondering, I won't be speaking of religion in a positive light today. These religions, these religious practices, these these following of rules and traditions and practices religiously, can I say that? Um, Often they're, they're done in a way that we feel like we have control over our destiny. They're done so that we feel like we will get from God what we want to get from God. You see, man defaults toward these types of religious tendencies because we're, we're all about being in control of our own destiny. If I do this, then X will or will not happen. You know, as long as I, as long as I read this and I go here and I dress this way and I have this standard or that standard and I, I do that or I do this, then X will or will not happen. God will, God will be forced to bless me. I don't think we'd ever verbalize it that way, um, but we often live that way. Or we may not be saying God will be forced to bless me. We may have the mindset of 
I will appease God's anger as long as I do this, this, or this. And all, of these, all of these issues really are religious thinking, religious practices that are not connected to eternal life. They're not connected to the gospel. The truth of the matter is God's plan for granting us eternal life has absolutely nothing to do with our doing and has everything to do with our trusting what God has already done. Trusting what God has already done to secure and offer eternal life to us, that is, if we can say true religion, that is God-honoring religion. Um, I've titled the message, Eternal Life is Not Connected to Religion, contrary maybe to popular belief. So let's find out as we look at this passage today how Jesus points out that religious practices and tendencies really are not connected to eternal life. Let's pray. Father, I admit my need for you to quiet and direct my own heart as I present your word, and I think I can answer for each one here listening today that we all need your help to illuminate your word to our understanding, and we need your help to apply it in such a way that honors you. We ask for that help in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look real quickly this morning at three truths that are worth our attention in embracing God's offer of eternal life. If we're going to embrace God's offer of eternal life, there are three truths, especially as it connected to religion, that are worth our attention. Notice, first of all, religion erroneously focuses on human ability. Start reading with me. You can read silently as I read aloud, starting in verse 1. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same, talking about this man, came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. What we see happening here, I believe, is a collision of a religious pattern of thinking with the recent demonstrations of the Messiahship of Jesus. What we see here is Jesus, no doubt, has been turning heads in his demonstration of his godness. Remember last time we were in this passage, we looked at three proofs that Jesus gave of his, his godness, if you will, his Messiahship, the fact that God had sent him to be the chosen one to bring eternal life. And his most recent demonstration was the overturning of the money changers' tables there in chapter 2 in the temple and kicking them and the sellers of animals out of the temple. And then he went on to tell the religious people there that day that he was going to rise from the dead three days after he died, highlighting his authority and power as the chosen one of God to bring eternal life. All of this, do you know where that took place, that overturning of the tables and the um, kicking out of the sellers of animals? You know where that took place? In the temple in, did you say Jerusalem? You'd be right. Good job. Um, yes, all that was in Jerusalem, the Jewish religious capital. Now, one of the religious guys there, Nicodemus, apparently started examining what Jesus had been, or, or actually what he himself had been doing in religious effort and how that wasn't jiving really well with what Jesus and his message of faith was coming across as. Verse 1 says that Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Pharisees were stringent followers of Jewish law. Pharisees, as we study scripture, are known to be self-dependent and self-righteous. They trusted what they did to get to God instead of what God was doing to get to them. It says also, not only was he a Pharisee, but he was a ruler of the Jews. He was a prominent leader amongst these religious Jewish people. Um, it's believed that he was part of the ruling religious, the religious ruling body called the Sanhedrin. Now, the Pharisees 
had a desire to be purists when it came to following God's laws to the point that they had become self-sufficient in their view of how the law could be followed. So, so they wanted to follow God's laws perfectly. They felt that that could be done. And so they, they became dependent upon self to keep the law, if you will. In a sense, they believed they could maintain the perfection that the law of God required and were, as a result, self-deceived about the value of their religious practices. You see, if you, if you get to the point, if you or I get to the point where we feel like we can maintain God's expected level of perfection, i.e. following all the laws, then what we will end up doing is placing this value, this intrinsic value upon what we do, because what we do is what then earns God's blessing, or is, what we do is what then prevents God's wrath. And so it turns into this, this cycle of as long as I do or don't do, God will do or not do. That's religion. That's what we're talking about this morning. Um, the Pharisees, just like you and I have a tendency, were proud of their religious accomplishments, and we can tend to look to our own religious efforts to keep us right with God. And you know what? That misses the point of the gospel. In fact, it misses the purpose even of God's law, because God's law was never to give man a self-confidence but the purpose of the law was to sober man with a realization of self-inability to keep the demands of the law. See, the law was never designed for us to say, okay, as long as I can do X, Y, and Z, then I'm good. No, the law was designed for us to say, wait a minute, I can't do X, Y, and Z, so I'm not good. I need something. Something has to change because I cannot keep this. James points out the that the, the very easy inability that comes out from that. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. It says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That faith being faith in Christ. You see, Galatians 3 points out that the law of God existed there to, and exists to point our attention to Christ, not point our attention to ourself and our own ability to keep the law because we can't, but the fact that Christ is the only one who fulfilled the law and He died in our place. He imputed His righteousness onto our account when we accept Him by faith. And so the law exists for us to see, oh, I can't do this, but Christ did do this. And I get to trust Him to fulfill the law on my behalf. The standard of perfection that God's law demands was never intended to give man an attainable goal to achieve, but to drive man to the atonement that only Jesus could provide. So we see this religious man, Nicodemus, coming to Jesus because something apparently was not adding up in his historically religious mindset as he was beginning to consider the truths of Jesus being the reconciler of man and God. And I think he was realizing that, wait a minute, my self-deceived notion that my own religious effort can get this job done, this job meaning right standing with God, wait a minute, something's not adding up here. If, if he's the Messiah, we're supposed to trust him but all along, we've been trusting in our own righteousness, our own ability to keep the law. Something is not right here. And so he goes to Jesus, apparently inquisitive, to find out a little more. Verse 2 shows us what we assume to be Nicodemus' fear of man. As it says, he came to Jesus by night. Presumably, he didn't want fellow religious people to see him. Now, there's conjecture out there as to... Why did Jesus, I'm sorry, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? We can only assume. Was it, I don't know. I, I really don't know exactly why he came to Jesus by night. I can, I can assume just like anybody else that it was probably he didn't want anyone else to see him. 
And there's a reason why um, the Lord chose to inspire John to put that detail in there that he came to Jesus by night. But what we also see in his coming to Jesus is a change in direction in Nicodemus' thought process as he, did you notice how he addressed Jesus? He addressed Jesus as rabbi. Rabbi, we went over already, I think last time, uh, was, the, was a, a term of respect. It was, a, it was a, an address of respect. And he was, he was now respecting Jesus. And he says, we, so apparently he was here representative of some other smaller group within the Pharisees. We know that you are a teacher from God because of the miracles you've done. I think what we're witnessing here is Nicodemus' eyes being opened to the transforming truth of the gospel of Jesus. The transforming truth of the gospel of Jesus is a realization that self cannot do enough to be right with God, but Jesus did everything to make us right with God. That's the truth of the gospel. And I think we see Nicodemus' eyes starting to open here. And what he was seeing in Jesus and hearing from Jesus was diametrically opposed to his religious mindset that there had to be a reckoning in his beliefs. Was he going to continue trusting self to do what was impossible, or was he going to turn to and trust Jesus as God's plan to make him righteous? And we all have to make that choice. We all have to choose, am I going to trust myself to make me right with God? through my religious practices, or am I going to trust Jesus to have gotten it done already? And by the way, I believe that's also a choice we continue to make even after we accept Christ in our sanctification. Will we continue to trust Christ and His, His having gotten it done, or will we, will we go back to, in a sense, trusting ourselves and our religious efforts to stay right with God? In the next several verses, you're going to notice that number two the gospel liberatingly focuses on God's ability. So whereas religious erroneously focuses on man's efforts and ability, the gospel liberatingly focuses on God's ability. Jesus, in his ensuing interaction with Nicodemus, uh, fills in some gaps, explains what it is uh, that uh, uh, the fact that God does the work in redeeming man, and it's not man's own efforts. There's two liberating truths that we pull from this interaction. Number one, man needs God's transformation. Take a look at verse 3, starting in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus tells Nicodemus that becoming a child of God involves a supernatural transformation that he describes with the term or phrase being born again. This rebirth is something that God does. This is something that God does when a person trusts Jesus as their Savior from sin. This is not a religious effort. This is a God thing. This is a God-enacted change in us. Dr. John MacArthur in his study Bible said this about uh, being born again. He said, new birth is an act of God whereby eternal life is imparted to a believer. This was a foreign concept to Nicodemus. In verse 4, in fact, he, he verbalizes his reckoning in his head. And he said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? I mean, how can, 
Now, you're saying that a man must be born again, but does he get back into his mom's belly and then come out again? It does, this isn't adding up. This was a foreign concept to him. Apparently, Nicodemus' religion left no room for the supernatural work of God in man's salvation. That's what religion does. Religion pushes out the supernatural work of God and says, no, I've got this. As long as I do this, this, and this, if I keep this set of laws, as long as I do these traditions, as long as I go here, go there, whatever, then I'm going to be okay. This was apparently an altogether different way of thinking for somebody like Nicodemus. In verses 5 through 8, basically Jesus is saying, without the washing away of your sin and the rebirth process re uh, produced by the Holy Spirit, you cannot be right with God. It's a hard concept to humanly understand, but Jesus says, listen, there are other concepts in life that are hard for us to understand, but we accept. And he used the example of the wind. He says, we can't see the wind, but we can certainly hear it. We can see its effects. We see what it does. Just like the mystery of the wind, we cannot perhaps really understand the ins and outs of the Holy Spirit's work in our rebirth, but we can certainly see the fruit of it in our lives and in the lives of those around us who believe as well. Perplexed by this new non-religious way of thinking, Nicodemus says in verse 9, how is this possible? How can these things be? It just didn't make sense to Nicodemus. And sometimes God's ways do not make sense to our natural inclinations. Sometimes it just doesn't come naturally to us to understand the ways of God. In fact, I would say not just sometimes, but a lot of the times. Because what we're dealing with is a finite level of understanding with, an infinite, with our infinite creator, God. And so there sometimes are elements of God that we don't understand, but let's not use that as an excuse. Because there is a lot about God He has given us that He has expected us and enabled us to understand. So I want you to notice the second thing here that Jesus points out is that man must embrace God's truth despite natural inclinations. In verse 10, starting in verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, this, this teacher in Israel, this, this leader in Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Jesus was addressing Nicodemus' lack of faith and what he had already said, what he had already demonstrated. Nicodemus' struggle to believe what, was, uh, what, what Jesus was putting out there was being impeded by his attachment to his religious security blanket. And as a result, was causing him to reject the very one God sent to impart God's liberating truth and salvation to him. You see, God provided Jesus as his word to Nicodemus. God had provided Jesus as his word to the nation of Israel. God has provided Jesus as his word to each of us. But the responsibility on all of our part is to Believe it. Believe it for salvation and believe it every step of the way in sanctification. But can I point out the obvious? We struggle to believe. We struggle to have faith, don't we? We are people who like to be in control. And faith relinquishes us of control. Faith says, I, I don't have it figured out. I have to trust somebody else. I have to let go. I have to let God take care of this. Um, faith recognizes that control is God's. You remember a while back when we were going through our study on Wednesday nights, it's been a couple of years now, on managing our emotions, and we were trying to take a look at what does the Bible have to say 
in dealing with unbiblical feeling, unbiblical responses to the perplexities of life. And there was a definition of faith. I don't know who this definition originated with, uh, but I really like it. Faith is believing the Word of God and acting upon it despite how I feel, knowing that God promises a good result. That's faith. Faith is believing the Word of God and acting upon it despite how I feel, knowing that God promises a good result. God offers us life-transforming truth in His Word. But you know what we must do with that truth? We must embrace it by faith, even when we don't feel like it. I'm going to be honest with you. Our feeler often is much stronger than our faither. Does that make sense? Oh, it's funny to think about it that way. Faith there is not a word, but you know what I mean. Uh, what we feel is often our, our compass instead of what we believe to be true from the Word of God. And you know, we need God's grace to flip-flop that. We need, we need God's help to let faith in His Word be our compass and let it then tell our feelings what they ought to be feeling. Our feeler should not trump our faither. So feelings should never be more important or more in control than our faith. In fact, our faith in God's Word should be what's controlling our feelings. And I'll tell you, that's a hard one. I, I got a pretty strong feeler. I, I, sometimes I'd rather just be numb, really. Sometimes I would just rather, like, not have any emotions because oftentimes my emotions tend to control me. And I bet that's your testimony, too, that your emotions tend to control you, but it doesn't have to be that way. Now, emotions, I'm speaking like emotions are this terrible thing. Emotions can be a wonderful gift from God. They really can be but only when they are in line with God's Word. You guys with me? How liberating it is, though, when we can plant our feet upon God's Word and take each next step forward in faith in His Word instead of in what we feel. I want you to notice how Jesus gets even a little more pointed as he continues to interact with Nicodemus in the final uh, verses for today, he points out, number three, that eternal life is an exclusive offer. Eternal life that Jesus brought to mankind was really a restoration of man's sin-wrecked spiritual condition. And he points out three things about this offer of spiritual restoration. First of all, spiritual restoration comes from Jesus. What I'm going to point out here is that spiritual restoration does not come from doing. Spiritual restoration comes from Jesus. Notice what he said in verse 14 and 15. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus was referencing a story from Numbers 21 that somebody who was steeped in religion, uh, especially, I would say not so much religion, but steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, um, would have certainly recognized this point. In fact, the story that Jesus was referencing was when Moses in the, the wilderness lifted up a bronze serpent on a stick and the people were healed from the venomous snake bites that God had sent there to stop their faithless complaining. You may remember that story. People were, were doubting God's plan for them. And they were, why did you bring us out here? You know, why, are we, why, why is this happening to us? And they were complaining and not trusting God. And so these snakes come. God sends these snakes. They start biting them. They need healing. And you remember um, Moses holds up this bronze serpent that... 
that, um, that he made here, and the, the, the teaching was, and the instruction from God was, you hold up that serpent, and the people will be healed if they look at the serpent, if they focus on the serpent. Now, that sounds a little funny, and the, really the idea was, as you trust God's plan, as you put your faith in God's plan, that's where God brings the healing. And, then, so, and actually, by the way, you, you've seen in the, the, modern, um, the modern symbols for, for health. For, for medical care is uh, typically called the rod of Asclepius. You've seen this before. You've got the snake on the, the sometimes it's a cross or a stick or something like that. Sometimes it's two snakes. And I, I'm not, I'm not going to dare claim that I understand even the, the Greek mythology that's behind some of that. But I tend to think that it came from here, from this story. I can't prove that. And maybe somebody else can or can't. But I, I like the reference that healing comes from God, that when we, we, we look to God and His plan, that's where healing comes from. And so what Jesus is pointing out here is just like in the wilderness, those people had to focus in on God's plan, which was that bronze uh, serpent lifted up on the stick, so people must focus in on Jesus on the cross to receive this spiritual healing, this spiritual restoration. Looking to Jesus on the cross Bring spiritual healing to all who will embrace it by faith. That's eternal life. The cross is not meant to be some beautiful piece of art, though it is. The cross is an effectual tool to point us to the healer of our terminal spiritual condition. And who is the healer of our terminal spiritual condition? It's Jesus Christ. But notice also Jesus points out that this Spiritual rest, uh, restoration is offered to all. This spiritual restoration is offered to all. Notice verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. There are two very inclusive phrases that Jesus uses here to show that his spiritual healing is offered to everyone who will receive it. God so loved the world, that's the first phrase, and the other phrase is whosoever believeth. These phrases would have been very eye-opening to those who were hearing them for the first time, I believe, because they pointed out that God's plan for redeeming man was not just limited to Jewish people, but to all people who would accept it. God's offer of eternal life is extended to all who will believe. May we not lose sight of that. It's not just for some, it's for all. And I want you to notice thirdly, Jesus points out, that refusal of this offer brings eternal condemnation. Starting in verse 17, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. What I want to pull from these last words of Jesus, in, in, at least in today's passage, is this. To reject Jesus' offer of eternal life is to receive eternal condemnation that comes as a result of our sin condition. To reject Christ is to receive condemnation. Romans 6 verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death. What we deserve, what we have coming to us because of our sin is death and eternal separation from God. Sin brings with it a condemnation that is universal to all people without the redemption of Christ. But God gives us a choice to receive or to reject. And everyone makes that choice. Now, 
this truth that God has given us a choice to receive or reject, it should first of all produce gratitude in those who've already made that choice. Jesus, thank you for saving me. But second of all, it should produce motivation to invite others to make that choice. Just as it was offered to us, remember it's offered to all, whosoever believeth. God so loved the world. We should be motivated by that truth to invite others to make that choice. And then third, we should, uh, it, this should produce urgency for those who've yet to choose Jesus. If you have never chosen to trust Christ as your own Savior from sin, this should be your, your sign of urgency today. Whosoever believeth in Christ shall have eternal life. But the opposite is true. Whosoever rejects Christ shall have condemnation. And so to be in a condemned status is not a good place to be. It's a terrible place to be. And so it should produce urgency. If you've never accepted Christ, please let us help you with that. Please let us open God's Word and show you how you can know for sure that Jesus is your Savior. So we see that religion erroneously focuses on human ability. The gospel liberatingly focuses on the God's ability. And eternal life is an exclusive offer through Jesus alone. How does one respond personally to this truth? Number one, by turning from religious dependency. It might be, returning for, it might be turning from religious dependency first and foremost by accepting Christ. Because you no longer can trust self and need to trust Christ. It might be you're saved, you already know Christ, but turning from valuing your religious practices as something that makes you right with God, that might be a decision you need to make today. Lord, would you help me to trust what you did on the cross to make me right with you every step of the way? Not any sort of religious dependency or accomplishment. How else might one respond to these truths? Maybe by rejoicing in gospel liberation. Rejoicing, thank you, Lord, for saving me and releasing me from the demands of the law. Thank you for releasing me from the demands of flesh. Thank you for giving me victory over sin and death and Satan. Lord, thank you. Maybe, maybe today your response is to rejoice in gospel liberation. And then third, a third way one might respond is this. By resting personally in this salvation that God has offered and sharing it with those that he's placed around you. That Jesus is the answer to all problems of life, to the problem of life, and that's our separation from God because of our sin. So it's resting in the fact that you have it, but it's also being motivated to share it with those who don't. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is even bigger than my delivery of it. Your word is powerful, sharper than any, any two-edged sword. Your word is what's able to pierce into just the, the deep, dark crevices of our hearts, our minds, our thinking. And Lord, I pray that you would use your word in each heart represented here today or maybe even listening or watching by live stream. Lord, the crux of life is what we do with Christ. It's not what we do for Christ. It's not what we do for you, but the crux of life is what we've done with Christ, whether we've accepted or rejected, and oh, the privilege we have to rest in Christ on a daily basis. Help us to take the appropriate steps in our own thinking in our own mindset today, as we leave from this place, help the truths of this passage to permeate our thinking in our hearts and our emotions in such a way that we rest in your gospel and we share it with those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.